Hello and welcome to the Gamers Tavern. This is a very special episode brought to you by our Kickstarter backers. Thank you very much for supporting the show. Ross and I are actually the guests on this episode as Chris Avalone takes over the show to talk about a project that is near and dear to his heart, Fallout. Now, a little bit of background to this episode. Back before Bethesda got the rights to Fallout, Black Isle Studios had a different Fallout 3 in mind with the development codename Van Buren. Designed by Chris Avalon and Josh Iyer, this game has more in common with Fallout 1 and 2 than what we eventually got in Fallout 3. The budget was pretty small for this ambitious game, so they had to cut corners during testing to make sure the mechanics were solid. Chris came up with the idea of creating a pen and paper role-playing game to kick the tires, as it were. And that unpublished, never-before-seen role-playing game is the topic of discussion for tonight. But before we jump in, I've got a couple of announcements to make. Ross Lauren and I will be at Comic Palooza in Houston, Texas. You know how everything's bigger in Texas? I dare you to go to their guest list at comicpalooza.com and not be impressed. You won't see this many celebrity guests at a convention outside San Diego. And that's just the media guests. We've been praising the gaming track at this convention before, but it's even more amazing this year. If you're in Texas and you don't make it out to Comic Palooza from May 22nd to the 25th, you're going to regret it. We're also having a Gamers Tavern panel on Monday where we're recording an episode live at the convention in front of you, our fans. Join us and whatever special guests we can round up and be part of the show. Oh, no, 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 no. I I'm not done yet. We have two, count them, two contests going on in the month of May. One I'm going to talk about right now, and the other one is going to come up at the end of the episode. The first is for Ross's new project, Warhammer 40k Regicide. If you've seen the trailers for this game, you already know what you're in for. If you haven't, it's Chess Meets Warhammer. If that doesn't sound amazing to you, I don't think you thought that combination through completely. You get to chainsaw and shoot grenades at the... Oh, God, I've seen this game in action. It's amazing. We have beta keys to give out for the next two weeks. How do you get one? We're giving them out by May 15th. We're giving one key out to someone who follows us on Twitter at Gamers Tavern PC, as in podcast. One to someone who likes our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Gamers Tavern and one who has reviewed our podcast on iTunes. That is three ways for you to enter and three chances to win a beta key to one of the best strategy games I have seen so far this year. And as far as our second contest goes, oh shit, let me tell you, if you're a Fallout fan, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to grab something that no other Fallout fan has or is probably even seen. So stay tuned until the end of the episode where Chris explains what the prize is and I tell you how to enter. Until then, grab a drink from the bar and take a seat at the table in the corner and we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor, Easy Roller Dice. Do you like dice? Of course you do. Do you need more dice? What gamer doesn't need more dice? Do you want to get the best value out there for your dice? Well, you're a Gamers Tavern listener, so you know to go to EasyRollerDice.com. They've got any dice you might need in any color you could want and some absolutely gorgeous dice bags to hold them all in. Oh, poor Game Master always stuck providing for the players who never seem to want to buy anything for themselves. Well, you can get over 100 dice in complete sets, not just randomly hobbled together from discards, for under $24, and make sure your table is well supplied. And we've got a special offer for you. Get 10% off their already amazing prices by entering the code GAMER, that's G-A-M-E-R, at checkout when you go to EasyRollerDice.com. We'll see you there. The Gamers Tavern Podcast is sponsored by Pinnacle Entertainment Group's Savage Worlds game, featuring Deadlands, 50 Fathoms, East Texas University, Weird Wars, and dozens of fantastic licensees. Savage Worlds is fast, furious, and fun. Hello, 
Welcome to a very special episode of Gamers Tavern. Uh, I am Chris Avalone, and through the generosity of Kickstarter and all of those who supported Gamers Tavern, I am permitted to uh, host a show about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, which is discussing the Fallout pen and paper game that we had back at Interplay when we were trying to develop systems and mechanics for the Van Buren project, which was Interplay's uh, attempt to do Fallout 3. And that is our subject. And I'm Chris Avalon, so I don't think I introduced myself because I'm classy like that. Uh, <laughs> and I'm here with a uh, fellow co-hosts uh, who may introduce themselves. Ross, do you want to go first? I'm your, your second host tonight, Ross Watson. Woo, yay! Welcome, Ross. Yay. On this very special episode, not not really like a very special episode of Blossom, but still a very special episode of Gamers Tower. I oh, know we may all learn a valuable lesson by the end of the things about not doing a crash diet. <laughs> and who are you in disembodied voice? Uh, I am Daryl Mott Jr. <laughs> Daryl, welcome. Thank you very much. So I got to ask, Chris, when, oh, when we're recording this, are you, in fact, holding a baseball bat the wrong way? I am not. Okay. And uh, for those of the for those unfamiliar with the joke, I had the pleasure of doing a cameo with uh, Tim Kaine, who's sort of the grandfather of the Fallout franchise. Him and Leonard Biarsky and Jason Anderson. Uh, so we got invited, me and Tim, to do these sort of extra scenes for uh, Nuka Break. Nuka Break. <laughs> and uh, in the cameo, I had the pleasure of holding a baseball bat upside down, which was kind of my my, visu my visual physical joke. And I'm like, all right, I'll go with it. It's fun. It was it was kind of your business. And yes, it was. It, I it can't it can't have done very much damage. Like baseball bats are actually pretty cool, but not when you hold them the wrong way. Man, was that awkward. I kept, I, I kept trying to revert back to normal just by instinct, and they're like, no. <laughs> Stay with the joke. Stay with the joke, or we'll beat you with the bat. I'm like, no, please. <laughs> you're like, you're miles out in the desert, buddy. No one's ever. Done that. <laughs> <laughs> Although the shooting for that, the shooting for Nuka Break uh, was pretty awesome because they actually took us to this abandoned mining town. Uh, I think outside of Indio. Like we right. drove for like an hour. You know, which is pretty scary in itself. Uh, and then, like, uh, we got to this totally ruined town where, like, I think four houses were still intact, and the rest of them were all gutted. And I'm like, oh, my God, we really are in Fallout. This is pretty terrifying and awesome at the same time. And they led us to this garage where they had set up all the props they had made of all the Fallout weaponry. And we got to, like, try out plasma rifles, uh, you know, uh, different uh, pistols. We had, got to hold, like, the, the Nuka Breaker, like, all of the weapons that you saw in Fallout, which are spread out on the floor of the garage, like this big candy store. Oh, that's so badass. Like, oh, my God, it was so cool. So we just, sat, we just sat there and, like, pretended to aim at various structures and then pretend to watch it blow up and, you know, basically, you know, designer imagination stuff. Well, anybody who's listening to the show tonight is probably a fan of Fallout, so I would mm -hmm. definitely point them in Nuka Break if you're a fan of Fallout because it's pretty goddamn awesome. Yeah, you can find the episodes online and uh, the company is Wayside Creations and I'm actually uh, working with them on the Legend of Grimrock movie, which is yep. pretty cool as well. I think it's about time the Legend of Grimrock gets even bigger and better and doing a movie is pretty cool. So, yeah, and we're here tonight tonight to talk about this this PNP uh, our role playing game for for Fallout. Now, this was in fact included in one of the game boxes, wasn't it? Basically, as an extra. Uh, that I'm not sure about. Actually, the pen and paper rules that we used to sort of test the mechanics for Van Buren uh, those were all house rules. Oh, okay. We developed, so we're like, okay. Here's all the perks we want. Uh, here's all the, you know, uh, the critical charts that we have. Uh, here's how all the different skills are going to work. Here's the new things that we're going to try out. And basically the, the premise for Van Buren is we wanted to try and do a fourth sort of like uh, archetype for the Vault Boy. Because usually okay. in Fallout, Fallout, the way it works is... Um, you have sort of uh, the you know the combat boy, you have the stealth boy, uh, you know, and then you have the uh, the, the, the smooth diplomat. Um, so what we wanted to do for Van Buren was see if we could expand the science skill a bit more with like uh, biology and chemistry and electronics and computer programming, 
and find ways to make quest solutions if you're just a super smart guy. And the reason we did that was because, I don't know if you guys have ever read a, a book called Lucifer's Hammer. I, I have heard of it. It's a pretty famous sci-fi book, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, in that book, one of one of the primary characters is able to just basically use use science to great effect to uh, help everybody else achieve various objectives. And, I, and after reading that, I was like, wow, you know, you could probably apply that to Fallout, you know, if we just had the right hooks in place. So part of the part of the purpose of for Van Buren was we wanted to make sure that uh, sort of smart and super science characters had cool things to do and ways to advance the game. We actually devoted some locations solely to science characters, too. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing we wanted to do was... Um, we wanted to introduce uh, two. We wanted to introduce ghouls and super mutants as playable races, and uh, we wanted to test out all the mechanics for them and give them like different traits and perks, or you know, and uh, and uh, that was yeah, that was part of the uh, the testing process that we wanted to use for the pen and paper game. Well, I have two questions really quick. I uh, first of all, Daryl, have you are you a Fallout fan? Have you played a lot of Fallout? Uh, I played the original Fallout way, way back when, and I didn't get very far. I sucked. But I did, did you kill my cockroaches? Many, <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Chris. Many times. Actually, uh, you know, the opening monsters in Fallout Rabbages. 1 are unfortunately rats. Oh, the rats. That's yeah, right. I, th I think in Fallout 3, that's when they become the cockroaches, and that's just disgusting. The rat roaches. Oh, and it was some sort of giant vermin just kept slaughtering me every time I left the the starting oh, town. Girl, I don't like like there are a lot of rats between the uh, the vault door and the exit. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot, and they I, <laughs> they get hungry. They've been waiting for you. I always like to imagine that the rat roaches actually can speak to each other and have a whole culture based entirely on 1990s slang. <laughs> We're the rat roaches. I would play that game. <laughs> but I did I did have a chance to watch Fallout 3 getting played whenever uh, the roommate I was living with, he played all the way through Fallout 3 and all the way through New Vegas, sitting in my living room while I just sat reading Fark and watching him play. So, so I didn't get to experience it myself, but I got to watch. The second question I have really quick is, just for the listeners, can we maybe define a little bit of what, who or what Van Buren is? So Van Buren was uh, Interplay's attempt <clears throat> to do Fallout 3 internally. And uh, Van Buren was sort of the code name for it. So, they, you know, in case anyone sees any design documents accidentally, like they don't immediately jump to, oh, my God, it's Fallout. But, you know, it's basically the font and the fact that the Vault Boy was all over those documents. Like, I, I, really, don't, I really don't think it would have been much of a secret. <laughs> anyway, so Van Buren. Um, so that was, that was the code name for it. It was leveraged off of an engine, which is basically the, the code base for a game that we were developing internally at Black Isle. Uh, and we were originally using it for Baldur's Gate 3. And the, yeah, which would have been great. Uh, so we spent uh, quite a while working on Baldur's Gate 3. But then there was... Now, this was called the Black Hound, right? That's Baldur's yes, Gate 3. Yes, and... Uh, so to this day, I'm going to put this in quotes because I don't really under, I, I was not privy to exactly what happened. But as as it was communicated to me, there was an accounting error, <laughs> Ooh, and uh -oh. which I which may have meant money didn't go where it was supposed to, and then we lost the uh, the rights to Dungeons and Dragons, which meant that we couldn't do Baldur's Gate three anymore. So we watched all this work just get flushed down the toilet. And that was pretty rough. I mean, they had uh, you know, some great character concepts, some really cool locations. The engine was coming along. We had the the editor up and going for setting up dial. Like, it was a bunch of stuff there. So that was pretty depressing. The only positive of it was that all those people then got the chance to transfer over to immediately start working on a Fallout 3 game, which we've been doing, but like, basically just me <laughs> for, like, the, like the, the past three years like before the end of Baldur's Gate to bring a full circle to pen and paper game. The, one of the reasons that um, I, I, I started running the pen and paper games for Fallout was because like, you know, I, I, there was no staff. It was just me. How would you test out the mechanics? How would you test the area layouts? You know, the different skill sets that you want, the turn-based combat rules, like, uh, is there any way to do that? And then it occurred to me, well, you know, the game's turn-based. So it's basically just running a pen and paper session. So I, um, 
asked for uh, volunteers around the studio, which was another plus because when you have the actual developers playing the game before they actually start working on the game, and then they adventure through the locations uh, or they like test out the skills themselves, suddenly they become intimately familiar with the design mechanics and area layouts. So you don't have to explain as much once you actually hit production, sort of like uh, when you hit the ground running. So that, that, was, that, was a, that was a good thing. Now, Chris, I'm, I'm just curious. It sounds like to me that this is the kind of thing that could only really be done with a game that has such a strong narrative focus, like Fallout, like Baldur's Gate, because you guys have always sort of championed the idea that even in a video game, there's more than one way to, to, to advance. You know, there's, you don't have to just kill everyone. You can talk your way out of it. You can sneak your way around it. And so it strikes me that this is an awesome way to, to sort of test out exactly what you said, you know, to test out how the game, uh, you know, is going to progress. But it sounds like it could only really be done with a game that has a really strong uh, story element to it. Possibly. I think that if, if it didn't have a strong story element to it, it basically would just be testing on a board game. Right. That's what but I'm saying. Just, right, so, but, I mean, like with Fallout, uh, definitely being able to do what I consider like a sort of standard role playing, tabletop role playing game. Like it was it was basically a perfect fit. Uh, and and it was actually it was a perfect fit in a lot of ways. Uh, one thing that was really great about it was true to Fallout tradition of like the 12 players that we had, because we had, we had, we had two groups uh, running at the same time, although they didn't, they didn't realize they were in the same universe, which was, which was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, was that each of those 12 people built a different character. And I had to figure out a way to sort of, sort of stretch my legs and go, okay, well, if this guy is a washed out boxer from new Reno and his soul, you know, his sole sort of like ego signature character shtick is that he's just really good at, you know, punching the hell out of people. How do I design encounters and situations so he's having a satisfying time while at the same time making sure that the tribal sociopath doctor who has all the charisma and diplomacy but very little fighting skills is also having a good time. So setting up that balance for every single area and making sure that everyone is sort of having their egos, you know, patted and hugged was, uh, was, it was a nice <laughs> challenge, but, uh, I think it made for, uh, for really a, a much richer area design. Now, a lot of this actually ended up, a lot of Van Buren actually ended up in uh, Fallout in Vegas. Isn't that right? Uh, actually, no, um, really? a, 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 what I would define as a small percentage of uh, Van Buren made it in New Vegas. And I, and I should probably clarify something. Uh, there, there were actually two iterations of Van Buren. Uh, the first one was the one that I was working on until I departed Interplay. Uh, and, and to be honest, the, the reason for that was after Baldur's Gate 3 had, was sort of unceremoniously flushed, I didn't have much faith that interplay would actually carry through on doing a fallout game although they ended up not do, they, they, and that ended up being true but not not for the reasons i thought they actually uh the, the demo for the second iteration of van buren uh was looking pretty good and uh, I, I was gone at the time but the way it was relayed to me was once the team had done that demo executive row determined, well, you know, it doesn't really have enough of a console focus and, you know, consoles are really, you know, obviously a big part of the market. And so therefore, you know, they shut the fallout game down, which was, which was pretty sad. So by going back to the first iteration of Van Buren, there are a lot of hooks and references to things that occurred in the, in that first iteration. So for example, uh, we had, there was that whole thing in new Vegas where, the, the Nightkin troops, who are sort of like the stealth troopers mm -hmm. of the Master's Army, they wear those stealth boys that sort of provide that camouflage field around them. Right. And one of the one of the rules in the pen and paper game was, hey, if you wanted to be a Nightkin character, you could. Oh. And so one of so oddly enough, to my surprise, and this is again like a game master has to stretch his legs. So one of our <laughs> players was like, Well, I want to be a super mutant stealth guy. And I'm like, Okay. And I'm like, that's not the first thing I would think of with super mutants, considering how huge they are. But, you know, let's, let's see how that all works out. And he role played that character great. 
But one of the hooks that we played around with was, hey, I thought it'd be kind of cool, like, you know, if you had visions every once in a while or hallucinations, you know, that would, you know, take an aspect oh. of the experiment. And then I'm like, but what would cause that? The stealth and boy. Like, and then I'm like, oh, well, maybe the stealth boy <laughs> over time cause cause your brain to start, you know, it's getting scrambled. Um, and I thought, hey, well, you know what? Super mutants have lived a long time. So, you know, with the the quality assurance tests with the stealth boys, they may not have realized this sort of mental degradation that would exist over time. His whole character arc was him fighting off, uh, like, uh, all these symptoms that were occurring and his choices to, you know, whether he actually wanted to use the stealth technology. And, you know, of course, you know, shit would, shit would go south pretty fast in every area. So it was really hard to not be able to use it. But it was, a, it was an interesting thing to explore. And, and that was definitely used in the, in the New Vegas game, obviously. Well, one thing that I, that I, th- that I don't think was uh, shown in New Vegas was we actually were going to hint at the fact that, hey, you know, the super mutants are getting messed up and their, you know, brains are getting scrambled. But there was actually like a subdivision of the Brotherhood of Steel uh, called the Circle of Steel, who was for like the internal affairs, you know, very high orthodox, like, you know, stick to the scriptures and that's it. They started using the Stealth Boy technology to start doing various things around Uh the wasteland that they thought would advance, you know, the the real ideals of the Brotherhood. And they didn't realize what was going on with the Pip Boy, with the Stealth Boys. So then they began to suffer metal degradation over time. So that started causing problems. Anyway, it it was pretty rich for a lot of drama. Uh, So Stealth characters, no matter what race you were, you would have plenty to do in Van Buren. I'm just pretty much guaranteed. Oh, that's, that is incredibly badass. And it always, it always struck me as kind of a real, uh, you know, as Fallout fans are, you know, you, when you hear about a game that's mostly done, right? And Van Buren was, is everything I've heard was that it was almost complete when it no. got, oh, really? Oh, okay. No, it wasn't. It was, uh, as I understand it, it was, it was largely sort of like a vertical slice uh, demo. There was a lot of design documentation for it. Oh, okay. I, think, I think a great deal of it's actually been leaked out on, on the web. Although I, I, I will say that the, the Denver design documents, uh, a, a good chunk of the Denver design was from what was actually from the pen and paper game. <laughs> and, the, and I think uh, Sean, I think the designer Sean Reynolds uh, helped complete that stuff. But the overall, a good chunk of Denver was, was part of the original design that I'd set up when doing the pen and paper game. That's awesome. So you go from d and I mean, you know, not only from Baldur's Gate, but through just the generation of what a role-playing game is to Fallout to a AAA console release, which is New Vegas. I, th- I think it's really interesting how you can trace that that path. You know, yeah. The um, and I again, like I think it's because of uh, we we had so many members of Black Isle uh, at Obsidian that uh, it seemed a good fit with Bethesda to do the to do to do New Vegas, and obviously we had all those um, old design thoughts and cool stuff left over from uh, Van Buren. And, and while we didn't use all of it, and some of it actually mutated uh, between the two projects, overall, there's still a rich amount of material. Some of the, some of the big things that transferred over um, from the first iteration was uh, the importance of Hoover Dam. Although in the first iteration of Van Buren, Hoover Dam was actually a community. What they would do is they'd build rafts out on the Colorado River and then they would brace them up against the actual dam structure and then, like, sift through all the wreckage that would come floating down the Colorado and hope that there wasn't a flash flood or anything. <laughs> um, the uh, A lot of the merchant intrigue that was in New Vegas was a big part of Van Buren because the problem that the New California Republic had, which was sort of like sort of like the West Coast government, that was, whoa, hello. Oh, well, that was my pacemaker. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I am now going to die on this show. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, uh, the one of the problems that the New California Republic had was the merchants had gotten too powerful. So they were basically uh, screwing over the actual government government and, you know, you know uh, basically running it ragged. So the NCR really had no power. So, you know, Lieutenant Governor Dodge had a we occasionally ask the players they came up here. It's like, hey, you know what? If you could weed out some of the some of the merchant <laughs> some of the merchant influence, we might actually be, might actually be able to make a difference here. But that was a that was a big uh, hamstring moment because uh, the merchants were basically the mafia. What else? Was I discussed the Nightkin stuff for the for the DLC content for New Vegas Old World Blues, which is 
amazing. And if you oh. at all love, again, I'm breaking in for the listeners, but if you at all love Fallout, oh my God, you have got to play Older Blues. It is, in my opinion, the best single DLC expansion ever. Oh, thanks, Rob. That's very <laughs> kind of you. It is so goddamn amazing. I, we were really surprised. We had like next to no resources working on it. And that's, that's the reason a lot of uh, the environments were using stuff just from Fallout 3 or stuff and then create for New Vegas because we actually didn't really have an art budget to make a lot of new stuff. So we were like, hey, what can we shuffle around? And like, hey, we'll make crazy labs that like, you know, have fake towns and stuff like that. And then uh, that just went crazy. And then we're like, hey, you know, for an ambient thing, it'd be funny just like to, just to, just to pursue comedy pursue some wacky 1950s style science lobotomites and, yes trauma harnesses yep the, the, the trauma harness was actually one of the examples of how we had no resources strangely enough so we're like hey we have a spacesuit <laughs> which is already built <laughs> and then strangely enough for uh for dead money which was the first dlc we released right uh there was one prop where it was important that we'd be able to position the skeleton. Like there was one corpse you find like all the way at the end of the game, which we just couldn't get a skeleton to lie properly in a bed. We're like, God damn it. This sucks. So the, so the, so the riggers that the, the, the modelers of the studio are like, okay, well we'll make a special skeleton. That's basically like, you know, a human being in the game and then we can move it around however we want. So we did that. And then, and then it, it occurred to me that, Hey, we still have that skeleton. But we could put him inside a spacesuit and then call it something else. And I'm like, and I'm like, why would a dead body be inside a spacesuit? And I'm like, maybe it's a trauma harness, and the oh, harness doesn't realize he's dead. <laughs> that's the best part. Yeah, well, was, you know what's funny is okay, dead money is is incredibly scary. I, I love it. It's very atmospheric. I mean, it's char- it is like pretty much all atmosphere, which is you know great. Uh, but honestly, uh, the ghost people in Dead Money are not nearly as scary to me. Well, that's not true. They're still goddamn scary. But they're not quite as scary as lobotomites are. And the reason why is because the ghost people you can hear, right? You know they're around. Lobotomites never say a word, ever. They, they just, you turn around and they're there, and you're like, oh my God. They are, they, they are big creepers, Ross. Like they're, they're like the equivalent of Facebook stalkers, but they're there in the flesh. <laughs> Well, you know, it would not surprise Errol, me to you, find Errol, out. You are that laughing. Was... You are laughing like like you know what I'm talking about when I say oh, stalkers. Yeah. Daryl, have you been stalked? No, but friends of mine have been. It wouldn't surprise me at all to learn that most people on Facebook are in fact lobotomites. You know what? That could be, <laughs> that could be how they uh, they swell the profile numbers. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, we got off track. Based on the way but... my Facebook wow. wall ends up, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> but yeah, you were talking about. Uh, I'm sorry, you were talking about. You were talking about it in the DLC. You were hinting at some of the things in Van Buren. And I think I know where you're going. I think you're, you're going to talk about uh, Christine. It was one of the mutations that happened uh, between uh, Van Buren and uh, her arrival in the DLCs. Uh, originally, uh, Christine was a, was a uh, sort of callback and sort of an homage to the companion Christine that was in Wasteland 1. And uh, so what I wanted to do is like, okay, well, you know what, I... For some reason, like, she's one of my favorite companions that I ever remember growing up. So I'm like, okay, well, it'd be really cool to have her in Van Buren. Not to go on a weird tangent, but uh, when we were examining, like, voice actors that we really, really wanted, for some reason, you know, I just wanted to get, like, Jane, Janine Garofalo to do her voice. I have no idea, <laughs> have no idea why. Um, we, we wanted to get her. Uh, we would have loved to have gotten George Papard if he'd been able to... Uh, that's so sad. That was so sad. Anyway, uh, and then we actually wanted to get uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, <laughs> to, be, uh, to, be, to be one of the, the voice actors uh, in Van Buren too. Um, so that that would be amazing. Yeah, we just wanted to have fun with the with the voice acting cast. So um, that that was part of it. Uh, you you must have been in charge of voice acting when they did Torment, because all those voice actors you would have never thought would have come together in anything. And this is this is I'm, I'm starting to figure well, out where that came together well, from. Yeah, we totally like we totally lucked out with uh, Torment's uh, voice cast. So actually, and Fallout Fallout did way better. Um, but the what what they did was um, they contracted. And I'm sorry, I cannot remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, all of this first name was Jamie. He was a voice director and uh, coordinator at Disney. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's no small claim to fame. 
But that meant that when he would talk to the actors, they would recognize his Disney position. And even though he was a contractor for us, they were more than happy to work with Jamie because Jamie was a steady stream of work that would possibly lead to, you know, much bigger roles and, you know, maybe right. all the Disney projects and nothing wrong with that. So when they brought in like, you know, uh, Shane Easton and, you know, uh, uh, I know Jennifer Hale, you know, she's got quite a wide range of, of voices. She does. Uh, she, she was great. The fact we got, uh, I cannot say his name properly, but uh, Dan Castellan. Uh, yeah, that guy. Yeah, I got, it, it, the fact, you know, we actually, I was trying to freak out when Homer Simpson walked into the studio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just all that stuff. And uh, the fact that we got, you know, you know, Skinner from, you know, the X-Files, like. Oh, my God. It was, it was really, it was really interesting because, like, uh, we we sort of had to massage the, the Dacon role sort of out of him. But then, like, once he hit it, he was amazing. Like I was, was like, wow. Like we didn't know that it was going to work, and then like he just he totally pulled it off. Like more to- total kudos to him. But anyway, um, so but Fallout One had a, a a much larger voice cast, and they had some really great talent uh, on that as well. Um, and I think that you know where Interplay was at the time, they had the ability to actually hire actors like that, and also voice directors like Jamie. So that that worked out pretty well. I don't know if Van Buren would have had the same opportunities, but I will say that we're working with Bethesda you definitely had those opportunities because, uh, you know, one of the, one of the nice things that, uh, our, uh, our producer at Bethesda, uh, Jason Bergman did was he actually took sort of like the, the big budget they would normally reserve for like high profile people like, you know, Liam Neeson, for example, what he, what he suggested was, Hey, you know what, we could actually take that amount and sort of divvy it up amongst, a wider range of actually, you know, you know, of equally not necessarily as well known, but hey, we can get Felicia Day in here, like you know, uh, we can get Danny Trejo, like oh, you know, hell yeah. Of, yeah, you know, and the, that's a you know that's an addition to the you know the the other the other signpost characters they had, but you know it was it really worked out really well, and I was pretty happy. I'm going to say this: Danny Trejo is the best Bane voice I've ever yep. heard. <laughs> yeah, he's got it. Yeah, he for uh, Young Justice, he was Bane. Oh. My God, man! When Young Justice got canceled, I, <laughs> I I loved that show so much. I thought they were doing so many things right. Oh, yeah, but you know, he was doing a great job for that. That's right. Well, one day Chris and I are going to work together on a superhero video game, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing, people. You know what? <laughs> and uh, my love for superhero gaming was born from pen and paper gaming too. And all my friends that I grew up with, they would they would absolutely support a game like that. Let's kickstart it. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of Kickstarter, I really want to take a moment just really quick and thank everybody for backing us to get to the point where we reached our stretch goal. And that's why Chris is actually r- running the show today. Mm-hmm. We reached an amazing stretch goal, which we couldn't have done without all of our great listeners, all of our great fans. Um, and frankly, uh, you know, Chris has just been extremely generous by not only sort of, you know, pimping us on his uh, Facebook feed from time to time, but uh, by being a guest, this is his second time uh, joining us on the show. The first time uh, he was a guest, this time he's actually taking it over. Uh, but, well, I feel, I, you know, I feel I feel a little bit bad because I just wanted to come back anyway. <laughs> yeah, but, that, but, then the, but then to see Gamers, Gamers Tavern get even more support and get to get even more uh, people interested in it, I thought was, uh, was, was a pretty damn cool thing. So it's, you know, it all worked out pretty well. And, uh, you know, and it's interesting. Like, I don't think I would have thought to talk about uh, Van Buren uh, unless you know I I had the opportunity to actually host the show, and I so I'd, I'd absolutely love to talk about it because I I don't think I've ever actually gone in depth as to what like what the pen and paper situation was and like how it translated into New Vegas and yeah, the, the only pen know, and paper Fallout that, I'd ever heard of was the the D twenty one that came out after the the game. I think it was no, it was before Fallout three. It was during the OGL era. It was based on Fallout one and two, I think. It's weird because I had this weird recollection that there was a PNP set that was released along with one of the games, like Fallout 2 or Fallout Tactics, but I couldn't... No, I, actually, with Fallout Tactics, they released sort of like a tactical game with it. And then I think I believe uh, one of the designers, uh, Chris Taylor, um, who I think actually is still working at Interplay, he's a, he's a, real, he's a really talented designer, not only of, of computer games, but he also does uh, board games right. as well. So... 
uh, he he likes to stretch his legs and do projects like that. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he was if he was sort of the brainchild behind that uh, that Fallout Tactics pen and paper. Because it actually had like little little counters like you could cut out too, right? And like it had, uh, yeah, like he had, he had actually even included like game pieces in with it too, which is pretty cool. Now people, there's a lot of people out there who you know kind of badmouth Fallout Tactics. I am a huge fan. Of Fallout Tactics, I love that game so much. Uh, you know, the best part about Fallout Tactics, well, there's several really good parts about Fallout Tactics, but um, two of the best, if I had to pick two things, are Lee Ermey as General Barnaby. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, I cannot think of a better guy to be a Brotherhood of Steel general. Um, and then secondly was you can, through a random encounter, actually recruit the Pip-Boy. And run around in the game with this crazy bobblehead looking dude shooting guns at Reavers and Super Mutants. It is amazing. I, I always went out and got Pip Boy in my squad. And I must have played that game like ten times. Yeah. The Pip Boy with the Pip Boy, not not the best I, I uh, not necessarily the Vault Boy, but the um the Pip Boy uh the players were wearing in Van Buren also was going to be slightly different. Um, oh, okay. So one thing that we wanted to do for science characters was they would have the ability to sort of assemble programs they'd they'd stolen from robot memory cores. Ooh. They could reassemble them on their Pip Boy with like the right computer science skill to sort of create new AI routines that they could sort of uh, download into other robots and then have them fight for their like have your like own little like robot army and your robot pets, which we thought would be pretty cool. And uh, we were we were playing around with the idea that when you start the game, your Pip Boy's functions aren't all unlocked, and it's got like back doors to stuff, and certain things that would get triggered by your environment. Like, for example, early on in the start of Van Buren, uh, all the characters are trapped in, uh, in what seems to be a, a military prison because you know, actually everyone in the game is either a an actual criminal who's been sentenced. Or they were wrongly accused by the new, new California Republic. So you, you have the choice at the start of the game to choose a variety of traits. You're like, hey, you know, I'm a murderer. Oh, look at me, I'm a gun runner. And I, the NCR just locked me up and threw away the key. But here's all the skill bonuses I got out of it. And then sometimes you can actually, you can actually be like wrongly accused. And you don't actually have to choose a crime if you don't want to. So this is like the background. This is what you did before you started adventuring. Yes. So that was a way of like adding like sort of your backstory into the uh, into the starting starting location of the game um and but anyway so like uh, and and when you first have the chance to escape this this prison facility um one of the causes of it is uh basically there's you know the equivalent of a fallout fire alarm but when that happens and you know this emergency situation detected your pip boy picks up on that and then suddenly new programs and new routines become available to you that weren't available before. So what we thought would be kind of cool is when the player triggers certain actions or events in the environment or even just explores a, a dungeon and, find, you know, finds a cool area or like, you know, a bank vault or whatever, the pip boy would suddenly get new powers just by you exploring the environment. So like emergency evacuation procedures may not sound very exciting, but when you combine that with... Pay, you affect the pathing routine of these robots, but instead of running away from the fire, they all go towards it and sit there until they all burn to death. <laughs> that suddenly ends up on a lot of a lot of cool a lot of cool possibilities. And um, so the pit boy was kind of like another way for you as the GM to you know kind of give information and give options to the players on a sort of spontaneous level. It could just be, it was based on like where they were and what was the surroundings. Right. There's and so many times I've wanted to do that as a GM and just say, okay, so you guys know this thing, but the pit boy was a great way. Like it's a, a pretext. It's like, I'm giving you this information, but it's in the context of the game. It makes sense. It's part of the immersion in the world. It's a really smart idea. Yeah. And, uh, it actually, uh, went even a few steps farther than that. So first off, so you obviously you could, you could assemble these computer programs, you could unlock, new interface options. We're like, hey, now suddenly I can read where all the other pip boys are in the immediate environment, which becomes important because everybody in the prison, for some strange reason, is wearing a pip boy. And it suddenly becomes very important over the course of the game to track down where all these guys are. So if you can unlock that functionality of the pip boy, that's fucking awesome. And you know it's basically battle royale. But they they can't sense you. You can you can sense them, which is which is pretty nice. Now this start so the game starts in a in a prison? 
Yeah, but it, you sure this is a Bethesda game? I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe we always knew. Like, <laughs> And, you know, the, the thing is, like, uh, you, you could do things like improve the radio or, like, uh, I mentioned the program compiler before. One thing, though, was one of the main antagonists in the game actually sort of had the the equivalent of the main operating system for the Pip-Boys installed on his Pip-Boy. So he had, like, the master control. So what he could do was he could blind you to his presence. He could do things like mess around with your interface he could do a lot of horrible things because he was kind of like, you know, the level the level 65, you know, science guy that you wanted to take down. Would this be Bill Nye's guy? No, this would be someone different. Actually, Bill, Bill Nye was intended for the uh, the Boulder Dome okay. in Van Buren, which eventually became the uh, the dome that was in Old World Blues. But the, the, the Boulder Dome in Van Buren was a lot more, was strangely enough, a lot more sinister. And it was sort of like the precursor to what would have happened to all the people that were still there. The, the idea was the, the super smart guy had convinced these very promising, smart individuals from NCR to actually come out to the Boulder Dome where they could be safe from all the fighting going on back west. But what he really wanted to do was if they didn't prove exactly useful, then he would just harvest the brains and then he would make those, you know, the, basically the think tank but not quite as comical, but they would still be useful from a science perspective to carry out his wishes, but he wouldn't have to worry about their bodies objecting anymore. So, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty creepy. All right, so this guy, this bad guy, he had a, the master pit boy, basically. Yes, and uh, what he would do is, he, he again, like he could do things like, you know, uh, you know blind your pit boy reprogram it, give it different quest objectives. And we actually tried to incorporate that into Dead Money. Right. Um, because initially... What I wanted to do was all the quest objectives you were getting in Dead Money would actually come from the main antagonist in that, where Elijah would just send you a quest objective, like, hey, go here. And then it would be written in his text rather than sort of like the default interface text. Right. And that, that was that was given a big no. I could have pulled it off, but messing with a pip boy I think was deemed unacceptable. But that was, we, <laughs> thought, we, we thought that would be kind of cool. Well, you know, starting me out with no weapons, no armor, <laughs> fighting hand to hand against a bunch of unkillable guys in gas masks. That's totally cool, but you can't mess with my pit boy. <laughs> you know, it, was, it, 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 it was super survival mode. I'm not going to. I had like a 38 special, man. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> no, I'm joking, but I do love dead money. So, but this, but this is for, for, this is all from the pen and paper is kind of where these ideas came from. Then. Yep. That's awesome. And the nice thing too, was that the players would actually provide uh cool hooks, you know, just with their character presence or things they wanted to try and do that, that added a lot more life to an area. I mean, sometimes there would be instances where they'd go into an area do something completely unexpected and cool. And then, you know, as a GM, all I do is I'm like, okay, well, that, wow, I wouldn't have expected that. And that's a really good quest option. I hadn't thought of that. And I just write it down and added the design doc for that area. So when we hit production, that would be one of the options you could do. I mean, it was much cooler than whatever original premise I had. They really should have uh, had this approach on Mass Effect 3. Just role played the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> actually, you know, I think I think Bioware actually has a process where they actually write out the story first before they hit production, which is which is kind of a rare thing and kind of nice. Um, I'm kind of envious of it. Well, uh, what I hear is that that process broke down a little on a third game. But anyway, uh, so I want to ask you about this this idea. You 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 showed us some pictures when you were getting ready for this uh, episode. You showed us pictures of character binders. Now tell yeah. us how, how did what are these and how did they come about? I realized that everyone would probably want to have a rule book, obviously, of the house rules that broke down, like, sort of, like, all, all the sort of very specific things this, this game of Fallout would have. And, and what it would do is it would, it would list all, the, like, the, for example, the crafting things you discovered, like, you know, you know, what your science skill gave you, you know, what new, like, hand to hand combat moves you would unlock from unarmed at a certain level. Um, and we, you know, gave all the list, like all the new perks and traits, as well as the, you know, the the, the Fallout One and Fallout Two Foundation ones. But also, what it would do is it would keep the keep a world map for the player. So it, basically, it was like a big a big Pip Boy. That's what I was just thinking. Is like it's it's sort of a physical representation of what your Pip Boy has. Yeah. So for example, like um, so one of the one of the characters in the and one of the groups was uh, he he was he was basically playing a science boy. 
and he actually had the the biology skill along with a little bit of outdoorsman, I believe. And then um, what he could do is that once they encountered a creature, he could get a much more detailed listing of what makes that creature tick ecologically wise. And then like he could set, you know, better traps, like you do more damage to it, extract the venom and, you know, help make antidotes for that stuff. And then I would, I would make sure all that stuff was available to him in, uh, in the binder so he could reference it whenever he wanted to. And like whenever like a new faction was mentioned, like suddenly they get a new handout. that's like, Hey, Caesar's Legion is like this. And here's basically what you guys know from a general knowledge perspective. And, the Van Buren uh, Caesar's Legion was uh, a lot different than the one in uh, New Vegas. Uh, the the Kaisar's one... Legion. Kaisar, thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and and in Van Buren, they they totally would have mangled the pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but basically, uh, the Caesar's Legion and and the first Van Buren. When the players had gotten locked up, like they were just like this, you know, cruddy band of slavers and drunks and no one really cared. And CR had a field day shooting them like, you know, fish in a barrel at Hoover Dam. But then like as the two, Chris. Yeah, that's what I feel like every day. (laughs) (laughs) But then like as the years went on while the while everyone was uh, was locked up, like Sears Legion started getting bigger and bigger because, you know, suddenly there was a ever growing, increasing market for slaves for some reason, you know. Certainly wouldn't have anything to do with, you know, super mutants wanting to rise again, but they need human stock to make new super mutants. So Caesar's Legion would, would feed the super mutants and desperately attempt to make these quotas every quarter. So basically, they were like a tiny corporation, but they all had, you know, but basically they, they were slavers. You know, they used a lot of, you know, uh, you know, sign shields and like crude weapons and whatnot, but they were really very businesslike in their speak. Like they always talk about orders and profits, you know, and man count and how many resources we have for this, which made it really weird to interact with them because on one hand they're rounding up, rounding up tribals and, you know, you know, gunning them down. But then on the other hand, they're like, well, how do we do the infrastructure for this where we can actually move this many units to this location? We need to maximize the profit and leverage the paradigm. If you know as many account executives as I do, that would not surprise you that much. Yeah, and, uh, and and one thing I want to do for that is when he actually met uh, the the mangled pronunciation Caesar in Van Buren, he's actually a, a pretty pragmatic guy. He's like, you know, I know this is not a sustainable economy, and what's worse is I don't think I've properly trained or have the right sort of person to succeed me if, you know, I die, in which case everything I've built here kind of falls apart. So if, if you're a male character... He will take you under his wing if you if you prove yourself, and then suddenly you have a chance to take over Caesar's Legion, and then suddenly make new corporate policy, and then use that as an advantage uh, over the course of the game and the end game. And then, and then um, female characters also had a different branch where they could sort of uh, contact these sort of like seeming medicinal healers in every village that sort of form their own network. And it turned out that their network of healers. They were called like the Daughters of Hecate. They were basically spies and infiltrators for every single community that they latched onto. The community would want them because, you know, they would provide all the cures. Like, uh, they, you know, basically they would, they would be the, the you know, the, the town doctor. But at the price of they would spy on everything. They manipulate local politics. Uh, they try and provoke certain tribes to attack each other that seemed like they weren't, you know, tribes anyone would want around and then uh once uh, once female characters became aware of that organization they would again have the choice to join that organization and take it over and then they could use that intelligence network to start manipulating other communities you know to the player's benefit over the course of the game which i thought would be pretty fun so these these binders are pretty awesome and it says here in the notes that you had these uh really interesting cards that you would give out yeah, actually, uh, so some of the house rules were the following. Uh, one was every character could have theme music. Ooh, uh, how did they, that work? Um, once per session, you could play your Fallout song. <laughs> and when you did that, you got plus 50% to any skill check you were doing. And usually people would do that solely to maximize their crit chance, uh, which, which makes perfect sense. We actually had two snipers, one in each group. Now, this would be representing them, like, turning on the Pip-Boy and playing the song, or? No, it was just, like, a moment in a movie where, basically, ah. music swells, and you're like, oh, this is his moment. Like, it was basically saying, it was basically a mechanic that said, here's the moment where your character shines. That's awesome. Now, like, I remember doing this in, in uh, Star Wars, the old D6 Star Wars. Whenever anybody spent a Force Point, it was mandatory. You had to, if, if you could play the theme song, you'd play the theme song. If you couldn't, you'd hum it. 
<laughs> so you would just go da na 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 na, and really then you'd roll the dice. It really gets you in the spirit too. I really thought it would be kind of cool for the computer game, as if um, there was a certain location on your uh, on your hard drive where you could put like your song on there. Ooh. And if we could find some way of incorporating that into Van Buren, we're like, hey, you know what? I I want the Ink Spots to play whenever I want to have my moment, and when I activate it. That's the song that comes on. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Why has anybody thought of this already? I mean, if you could imagine you're playing like, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto or something and you have a specific song that plays when you manage to evade the police or something like that. Yeah, you know? I, I think it could work out pretty well. And, and again, oh, the, the more you can customize it, for you know, for you, I think, you know, obviously the better. So it, it, it seemed like a, a fun thing to try. The, that's the got to be a other... nightmare of licensing, though. Well, we figured like if 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 it was a if it was a local player's choice and we didn't actually have it on the disc, like if they, yeah. if, they yeah. if they yanked a song down from somewhere, like that would be fine. Um, I, I guess maybe I was, maybe I was being very naive from a game design perspective, but uh, it seemed like a cool thing to try. Um, so the cards. Uh, so we had three different types of cards that we gave to people who were playing the game. And they were supposed to simulate the fact that you could only use first aid and doctor a certain number of times a day. You know, so the, 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 the doctor in the first party, uh, he, he might have like, you know, five doctor cards, you know, and, you know, five, five first aid cards. And then when he would heal people, like he would just cash in a card and I would take it. And then whenever he would sleep, um, then, uh, or they would rest, I would be able to give it, give it back to him and go, okay, your cards are all recharged and you can use them again. It's just a way of keeping track of, um, how many times you can use the skill. Also, we had these things called hip points. Which uh, we we wouldn't we wouldn't have used in the computer game, but it was a way of saying, hey, the more you're actively trying to participate in the session, or you know, the more you're trying to role play, or if you have just a really cool idea, you know, just by exploring the environment, the more you participate, like here you go, here's a pit point, and you know, when, when and you can spend those later on if you want to be more assured of your success with something, and that was just a way of trying to encourage people to get to do more role playing and get more involved in the game. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a system called Savage Worlds right now that has a thing called Benny's in it that work very, very similar. Yeah, actually uh, I did a uh, pen and paper writing for Savage uh, Worlds. We, uh, I worked uh, with, right, well, Ross, I worked with you. Oh my God. That's you're, you're damn right. You did. You <laughs> yeah. and uh, George Zeitz actually worked together on a, a product for us called Sand and Stone. Yeah. It's a campaign source book for that. So for anyone not familiar, uh, Accursed is a fantastic uh, setting for Savage Worlds where you get to play a wide range of Accursed characters that take on archetypes of monsters that you may have seen from <laughs> literature to movies. You can be, well, you can be shades, you can be uh, vampires, you can be uh, the golems, like all this great range of stuff i'm like i guess mongrels were always my favorite because they were always the spliced together animal <laughs> parts and, the, and their and their their overlord just seems so twisted but yeah no it's it's definitely worth checking out i had, I had a blast working on that thank you chris yeah and, and it was awesome having you guys work on it so yes you have actually written for savage worlds and yeah the, the, the idea of this in-game economy is what we're talking about these pit boy pip points um is very similar to things that's, that's actually been evolving in, in the last Oh, I want to say 20 years of uh, role-playing game design. Daryl, is that about right? How how long uh, this kind of idea has been around? More or less. Maybe longer. There's There's been games that have done similar things, but nothing quite the way Savage Worlds was doing it with Deadlands. Well, all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just generalizing, though. I think that this is... I, I was, what I'm getting at is that Chris was kind of ahead of the curve when yeah. he was doing this for. for oh, that's the first, I think that's the first time anyone's ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like I'm lagging behind out of breath. Well, it, what's funny is uh, the idea of an in-game economy it goes back to a game. The, the, what at least in my research, I traced it back to a game called uh, Super Babes, which is for uh, mm, uh, yeah. the Femme Force uh, setting. Which in in, the, in that game, they had the very unfortunate. Uh, moniker of uh, bimbo points, <laughs> but uh, they were essentially a in-game economy that you could spend uh, in-game resource to spend on things to uh, do better. Um, and they've kind of evolved from there. Uh, so pit points are are really cool, and they make me think that they had something to do with pit boy. Like I, I like when you level up in uh, in Fallout because your little pit boys where that's the interface you use when you level up. Yeah, we had we had cards for uh, obviously for the skill usage and then uh, for participation and then. Uh, we actually also, one of the things the binders stored was I actually made sheets for every single inventory item. Wow. So whenever you found something, you got the sheet. 
and things like, hey, well, you know, I found the, you know, the nail gun, you know, well, that's just great. Or, well, you know, I, I found the crappy toolkit. It would literally just be called, it's like literally on the sheet, it would be like crappy toolkit. <laughs> um, <laughs> and like some of its stats would just simply be crappy. Like they would, I, I, it was a lot of fun to write those. If I can ever share some of those or fun, find them, I, I would love to do that. The, um, but then, then like there would be those moments where like the first time you find the combat shotgun. Like, and that was a moment. Ooh, yeah. It's like, suddenly this new sheet appeared, and they're like, combat shotgun. Nothing crappy about it. Here's the <laughs> cool stuff that it does. And I'm like, oh, my God, how many shells do I have? I want to start firing this thing immediately. Yeah. Uh, and then you can find out a whole bunch of cool stuff. Like, you find, like, uh, you know, place, you know, riot vests or, like, riot helmets or, like, construction gear from the Denver Scavengers. Um, you know, they even had, like, bomb disposal suits you could get. Plenty of explosives. Like, all, all the powder gangs that were in New Vegas. Yeah. That, that was actually part of uh, the first Van Buren. Well, what, what would happen was um, the New California Republic was trying to sort of domesticate criminals by getting them to work on the railroads. But then they foolishly made the mistake of giving them access to explosives hmm. and then not treating them very well. And then the powder gangs were born. And then that just caused a huge mess. So one of, one of the camps that you find in Denver is actually sort of this displaced powder gang that's still trying to carry on scavenging operations because, you know, if you have a city the size of Denver, you know, that's basically been washed with radiation, there's a lot of, uh, like, glass and iron and all sorts of resources you can take away from it provided you have someone to work that location and kind of mine it. So, like, the Denver scavengers were, like, holed up on the, the top stories of these skyscrapers. So what they would do is, like, descend down into the Denver depths and, like, you know, mine it for, like, glass or, wow. you know, tire rubber or, like, uh, cabling or copper wire. And then they would, they would accumulate that. And then um, you could become part of that sort of infrastructure and be, and be a merchant dealing that with dealing that as well. Now, in, in this Van Buren pen and paper, if I'm playing and you're the GM, uh, is there a way for me to do that kind of uh, VATS called shot thing? Uh, yeah, actually, because it was turn-based, uh, everyone had access to uh, the hit location charts for every creature. And I actually went through all the critical charts in Fallout 1 and Fallout 2, and I made uh, uh, sort of spreadsheets and binder entries for those, like even the Brahmin. And actually, <laughs> interestingly enough, doing that, I found quite a number of bugs. I'm like, oh, no wonder no one could hit that creature. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I was probably, I hate to admit it, but whoever was setting up the critical charts, the, the, there was some some omissions. Um, so yeah, that what they would do is like, hey, you know, if I want to shoot in the groin or the eyes or whatever, that information would always be provided. And I would always make sure I had that on hand. Like, hey, okay, here's the rat scorpion encounter. Or here's like you know, the crazy Denver dogs or like the robot dogs. Like, and, and here's the the crit charts and the locations that you can hit for each one. I always like that in Nuka Break when the character actually goes into vats and starts taking call shots at some of the time. Yes, actually, so we, we actually uh, weren't going to weren't gonna have a VAT system in Van Buren because it was just because it was going to choose Fallout 1 and Fallout 2, right. like turn-based mechanics. I think VATS was uh, was Fallout 3's oh, yeah. introduction to try and make that, that called shot and sort of like slow down and pace out the combat option. Although, uh, I, 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 although I have to confess, I'm not familiar with all the design reasons behind it, but that, that's what it felt like. And I, you know, I certainly used VATS quite a bit. So uh, in, in Van Buren, in the pen and paper and I guess in the planned game, uh, what was going to be different about it from the Fallout 3 that we, we got from Bethesda? Uh, I'll say turn-based, uh, the isometric. It would have an interesting mechanic where the, where the theme of Van Buren was this principle called the prisoner's dilemma. Oh, yeah. Over the course of the game, it becomes pretty quickly apparent that there's a rival group of party members out there. Oh, I love this idea. Yeah, they're not... They're not bad people. They just quite likely have a different set of objectives than you do. <laughs> hmm. And when you do things in one location, they're doing things in another location. And then that causes ripple effects. So actually, it's like two stages of reactivity that occur. And then over the course of the game, because like early on, uh, the, the super science guy I mentioned before with the, with the overriding pip boy, he's a big proponent of the prisoner's dilemma. And his whole thought is, you know, generally, like, you know, if you can find the right people to cooperate with, you know, the, the gains you can get are immeasurable. But somehow he's still kind of blind to the fact that maybe he should apply that to your party. Um, so <laughs> so te 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 teaching, him, teaching him that principle could be one of the options of the game. But the, the whole idea was I just thought it would be really interesting to 
have a sense that the world is moving on around you and then have it be due to a collection of individuals you understand very well because everyone you know has a you know party they go around with and fall out you know, well usually and so that just thought that'd be a cool dynamic and so when we're doing the um the van buren pen and paper game that's why uh, i ran two different sessions but that did, ah. but, 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 but then didn't didn't clue them in on that they were both in the same world that's so interesting them. so for example um like one of the groups uh like you know, stole a train because still stealing a train is fun, <laughs> and, and, and they drove it right through this. You know, uh, Iron Iron Rivers tribal camp, which you know, Iron Rivers is like a bunch of tribals that worship the railroads, and um, r- right right when the tribals had just been attacked and conquered by Caesar's Legion, so they 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 drive the tr- the train like right through there and kill a bunch of Caesar's Legion guys and then run because you know that, that's brave, but uh, you know it, ah. it it made sense at the time. So what happened was the second group, who was much slower in escaping the prison and taking their time, they actually got to scout out like the Iron Rivers community. They saw the wrecked train. They saw the consequences. And then even better, because most of Caesar's Legion had gone off in search of the first party, they'd left the community undefended. So then the, the second party wiped those guys out, rescued all the tribals, you know, got them on their side, and then made off. <laughs> You know, with all the loot from Caesar's Legion, and then took off entirely. Direction. <laughs> so, you know, as you can understand, like these slavers are hugely confused at this point because, like, suddenly all these people, you know, with vault suits are showing up, and they are wreaking all this havoc. And it seemed like there were just six of them, but now there's twelve. And like, how many are there? And then over the course of the game, like all the communities start realizing, like, that there's you know well over a hundred of these guys spreading out everywhere, um, which is bad. Uh, for various reasons, one of which is the reason you were in the prison in the first place is because you're all kind of carrying the new plague that was hitting the fallout world like before all the nukes dropped. So the, the prison was actually trying to keep you guys all contained until I could find a cure. But then when you guys all start scattering, this incurable plague starts getting spread throughout the remaining population in the world. And so then you have to retrace all your steps going through each community. So each community that you would have hit it takes a little while for the plague to start taking effect. But then like a few weeks later in the world, like people started dying, Brahmins started dying. And you're like, hey, that's kind of weird. I just went through that community. I wonder why that happened. Oh, so and it's that, getting you to retrace your steps. You yes. Know, you, you're backtracking and seeing the, the changes that have occurred. Yep. And sometimes it can be pretty bad. That's awesome. Yeah. So I thought it'd be an, uh, an interesting mechanic to, to try and play around with. Like you're not you're not trying to be the bad guy, uh, but you, you have to you have to fix this problem that's occurring. And it's. You know, it has the chance to wipe out, like, any future hope of any civilization whatsoever. We're going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit about Audible. Did you know that they have over 150,000 audiobooks on their site? Did you know that they've had books we've talked about on the show before? The Dita Paxinarian, Lies of Locke Lamour, The Dresden Files of Song of Ice and Fire. You can join now with a risk-free trial and get any book of your choice for free. You don't like it? Cancel and pay nothing. But I'm sure you're going to love the free books and the additional discounts you'll get by signing up. Just go to audibletrial.com slash gamers tavern and support the show as you act like a kid in a candy shop going through all these amazing books. If you have time to listen to the podcast, you have time to catch up on your favorite books at audibletrial.com slash Gamers Tavern. Uh, welcome back uh, to Gamers Tavern, where we're discussing the Fallout pen and paper version of Van Buren, which is Interplay's uh, first attempt to do their own version of Fallout 3, which didn't pan out. But a wealth of experiences were, were raised from it that went on into the Fallout future, especially in Fallout New Vegas, possibly only in Fallout New Vegas. <laughs> and when we last left, you were talking about this new plague that we were spreading that was... Yeah. That's why we were going back to see things that had changed from the areas we had uh, adventured through in the earlier stages. Yeah, and then um, the the question then becomes containment, uh, cure if possible, and then like what like what how the hell do you try and contain this this very shitty situation that's just developed? And then, and there's there's plenty of other uh, faction problems that aren't even spurred that aren't even spurred by this, like NCR is falling apart. Uh, the Brotherhood of Steel is, you know, attacking them full force. And, and 
the whole the whole fun of that situation was actually in in Van Buren was because of the enclave. So what no one realized is when at the end of Fallout Two, when you blow up the oil rig, big spoiler. I mean, you you blow up the bad guys. <laughs> is that the the enclave uh, still has pretty much uh, you know missiles and you know a nuke in reserve? So what they do is they're like, oh well, the only person or group of individuals that could you know have blown up the oil rig would have had to have been you know the people in San Francisco. So what they do is they, they nuke the shit out of San Francisco. Uh, and they kill all the you know the Scientologists there or whatever. <laughs> the Hubbaholics. Oh my god, that was so bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so say they, they killed all the Scientologists? Uh, <laughs> yeah, let, let's start, let's pick up on that one with and they kill all the and give the right name because uh, I don't, I, 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 I don't want to get on their bad side. No, we just, and that was exactly our issue. Too. Anyway, so I'll just to, to retake. So uh, the Enclave was like, well, the, the only group of people that could have caused that oil rig to blow up and attack us would have been the Hubologists that were in uh, San Francisco. So they proceeded to drop a nuclear warhead on San Francisco and wipe it out. <laughs> Everyone misinterprets it because no one, really knows, no one really knows what the Enclave is. Like, like NCR doesn't. The Brotherhood of Steel doesn't, doesn't really know. NCR promptly blames the Brotherhood of Steel. And the Brotherhood of Steel is convinced the NCR had something to do with it. So they start tearing into each other, like, ruthlessly. And NCR had a lot more troops. Uh, but, you know, of course, you know, Brotherhood of Steel has power armor stumbling all around. And uh, so that conflict gets pretty brutal until... <laughs> uh, so one of the companions we did in Van Buren was actually uh, one of the Brotherhood of Steel elders. He was actually um, the precursor to Elijah and Dead Money, but he wasn't a dick. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was actually... He was actually a pretty nice guy, except for one thing that he does is he realizes that, you know, so the fighting has to stop. But the only way that he can think up to make it stop, really, is he shuts down all the access codes to the Brotherhood's power armor so they can't actually fire them up anymore. So suddenly they're they're without their, you know, their armored suits and they still got weapons and things like that. But ultimately, suddenly things really tilt on NCR's side. And and part of the, the arc in that game, the arc in Van Buren is, you know, you can recruit this guy. And contrary to Brotherhood teachings, he actually only uses, like, really primitive weapons. But he's just really, really good at them. But he also has all the codes, the power armor stored in his head, so he has the ability to sort of resurrect the Brotherhood of Steel to what they used to be. Um, so that, I thought it would be a cool, a cool arc to explain. Oh, that's, that's really impressive, mm-hmm. actually. I was actually thinking earlier about this guy you were talking about with the prisoner's dilemma. I can almost see in my head how that speech challenge would work out when you meet that guy, because I can already imagine him saying, well, yes, cooperating is the right way to go with all these other people. And then you're set before to say, uh, what about cooperating with us? You know, the guys who are actually changing the world. <laughs> yep. Maybe just then you might want to yeah, cooperate and, and, with exactly. us. Exactly. And, and, and you have your, and you have your master in Fallout One experience, which, which was my hope, and 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 the ultimate moment for you know any any science boy or super intelligent character is when when you build up you know this other guy in the game as being oh you know my god like he's, he's like the super scientist. And actually, there's even there's even worse aspect to him in that he actually you know is similar to Mister House in New Vegas in that he existed before the war. He just went to hibernation and then woke up and then found the world went to shit. Huh. And then he tries to make things work in the world for about 10 years, realizes humanity still fucks. So he's like, you know what? We just got to start all over again. <laughs> but the speech challenges with that and using science to your advantage, all of those things would factor into sort of a combat dialogue battle with him. And, and one thing we try to do with the speech skill uh, that we tried out in the pen and paper game is uh, – is we would actually give characters with a high enough speech and charisma additional sheets for their binder that would give them an instant vibe for people they were talking to. And mm-hmm. what I mean by that is it sort of like would give a psychological reading of the person you're talking to. So, for example, one of the characters who was in the Boulder Dome who was trying to run things uh, was kind of a control freak, and he's kind of a jerk. But he's only a jerk if you challenge him. If you rephrase your questions and you turn it around, so like you're asking him for advice or you're deferring to his authority, even though you're still you're still like going after the same thing as the the guy who might be challenging him, he'll suddenly agree with you. 
he's like, oh, well, as long as my authority's not being challenged, I'm not going to be an obstacle to you anymore. And we, we, had, we had like little intel sheets for just about all the characters you've had in terms of, hey, here's the things they respond positively to, and here's the things they respond negatively to. And That's a um, really cool idea for even just like a regular tabletop game. If yeah, you're a GM. Like, it seemed, like a way to, it seemed like a way to make the speech a little bit more valuable, and then it, then it made like every character you met kind of a puzzle, which was kind of nice. Yeah, so that was that was a lot. That was a lot of fun to do. It, it sort of harkened back to uh, to Fallout Two when you were talking to Lynette in Vault City, and as long as you always addressed her by her proper title and used the proper manners versus the more casual or slangy approach, you actually built more reputation with her in the conversation until she gives you more authority and like better access to resources and you know promotes you to you know captain the guard and like stuff that wouldn't normally happen with someone just not not aware of the social niceties that you should do so having speech characters shine like that was kind of kind of important thing to me no it's it's giving me ideas now for my birthright game where i have uh, some people with some pretty high diplomacy skills and maybe i should kind of take a page out of this uh, binder if you will and maybe use it in my game that's that's kind of neat what do you think daryl yeah, that's definitely something you could pull into almost any game that has any sort of social interaction as kind of a core part of the campaign. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm I'm kind of distracted going through the possibilities in my head for for the D D <laughs> game. So <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you were just giving them an extra page that would kind of give them a breakdown of what makes this person tick, and they could yeah. use that or not at their right. And, and then the trick of it would be that. It would depend on your level of speech skill. So you might you might only get part of the picture, which could which could potentially be bad. But still, you would have more information than you would like. You know, someone just you know running off the street or like the ghoul mechanic we had often did. So he he had no speech skills whatsoever, and plus he was a ghoul, which was even worse. So in this game, you could play ghouls. Oh yeah, ghouls, super mutant. We had the first party had one super mutant, one ghoul, and the rest were humans. Awesome. And this yeah, was, and then was, the, uh, carry, was this something just for the pen and paper, or were you going to carry that over to the game? Too? Oh yeah. It was, uh, that, uh, well, we were we were going to do it in Van Buren too. It's, you know, it's in Van Buren didn't happen, but yeah. we wanted to see if those races we could do cool things with them. And, and ghouls had a lot of cool powers. Like, uh, well, obviously they could survive in radiation zones, live really long time. <laughs> and then they, they, they had really good pain thresholds. They were you know natu- usually natural mechanics. Uh, one thing they had to watch out for, though, was they had to worry about getting going feral, or they had to worry about getting too much radiation and turning turn into one of the glowing ones. That were yeah. like a flat one, but you could do that. Like that was one of your traits, and per- like, you could actually turn yourself into a glowing one. And you could like tear into enemies like that, which was kind of cool. And then like, the ghouls, just like the super mutants <laughs> did, had their own sort of <laughs> racial injustice going on in uh, in Van Buren, but. For once, uh, the ghouls actually went on the offensive, and they, they sort of uh, got all, all the ghouls that were in Gecko and Fallout 2 and, and Van Buren. They get united under one leader who's actually strangely militaristic and quite a good tactician. And he just he, he's just a bad kind of a bad guy, but he's able to marshal all the ghouls, like uh, free them all from, you know, supplying power to NCR and Vault City and all that shit. And basically start trying to carve out a nation for just them. That, that was kind of the, the arc for him. And the super mutants have to worry about, you know, being thrown on the reservation and slowly watching their their kind die out if they can't find any, you know, any more humans or any more of the FEV to actually restock. And uh, I, I thought super mutants, they pretty much have the <laughs> the, shittiest, the shittiest role in, in fall because they, they're pretty much doomed to die. It's just a matter of you know, watching the years go by and, you know, there's, your generation is going to die out. Um, well, I don't know, man. I, just for the listeners, being a glowing one, right, which is where you literally glow with radiation, you are putting off so many rads that it's unhealthy for anyone to be near you ever. <laughs> I mean, if if I transformed into that into the party, I can already imagine the conversation. So yeah, we uh, we think you're great. We really enjoyed you know having you in our party, but it's time for us to part ways. We need you to either put on this lead suit and live in that forever, or see you later. Have a nice have a nice life. <laughs> have a nice half life, I guess. Well, the, uh... <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the the second the second party actually had a. Uh a ghoul that was the equivalent of sort of the toxic avenger like he was basically <laughs> he, he, no, he was actually he was, he was actually like a, a walking just uh oh you know, toxin spitter he's like a huge waste pool and what he would do is like if enemies get did get too close to him they, they would start decaying or if he slashed them or if they cut open him with wounds like his perks and his skill set were, su- were such that he could ingest poisons which wouldn't affect him 
But then when anyone else tried to attack him and then suddenly wounds start spurting everywhere, or like, you know, chemical gases start erupting from, like, you know, mustard gas blisters on his skin. Like, fight, fighting that guy, not a lot of fun for the enemies. And you know what? Animals don't like him either. And they'll, they'll run. So, like, there's certain ways to turn pretty horrible things into, like, cool character advantages and he, he was he was kind of a cool character for, uh, to try and find new ways to make him shine but he was a he was a pretty good combat character i was pretty impressed the I fact guess, that he, but just uh, trying to think of like stopping for a meal be like no you got to go way over there dude you gotta go, you gotta go way over there <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, it was a it was an interesting take on a character i'd expect like, like ghouls and super mutants could get like a, a variety of like different traits and uh, perks like they could get they grow claws they could um they, again like the toxic the toxic sponge i mentioned before i just mentioned also you could even uh have a bonsai tree growing out of your head which would Herald. Be, yes so you could become like Harold and like you could get like a little fruit okay. like once a week yeah it's t- <laughs> totally cosmetic but You'd always have your fruit. Now, there are a couple of perks here you have listed that were originally just for some NPCs. Yes. Yeah, what I tried to do was uh, some of the NPCs, to to complement their personality, would actually have perks and abilities the player would. And so, but there would be things like that that were just fun for me to to play around with. And like, I thought that if they worked out really well in the NPC, then I would would graduate them over to the PC side. But maybe maybe things like, you know... uh, there was a character in the game who was like the mother hen of the community, and that gave her certain bonuses uh, when she was like dealing with social interactions or getting resources or bartering for stuff. And she also had the car fetish uh, trait. What? Yeah, actually, we, we, we had one vehicle in Van Buren, which helped like make circuits between towns. It wasn't actually a weapon you could use or like do free range driving. It was more like the car in Fallout 2 where it could just jump you to locations. But you had to repair it, get it out of the Boulder Dome, which was not an easy thing to do. Then, then it could become sort of like your cargo for getting stuff back and forth. But mostly it was actually going to be the trains that could get stuff moving back and forth across the environment as you explored it. When I mentioned the Iron River Tribals before, they because they worshipped the trains, they knew where all the tracks were. And then once you could train them to take care of the trains and clear away the track, then suddenly you could actually start rebuilding the network. And because they, they thought it was like their tribal you know religion to do this, you had a lot of really you know, eager workers that are doing it just because they love it. And that's pretty easy on the player, but it's all a matter of if you, if you get them on your side, in which case you suddenly realize that suddenly all these new infrastructure opportunities become available. So by the way, now where does the car fetish come in? I was about to say, uh, I, I saw this in the notes where it said car fetish, but I was leaning way back in my chair whenever I was reading down that far. And I read cat fetish and I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I would not be surprised if that was one of them. Because yeah. <laughs> outdoorsmen, outdoorsmen in Van Buren would allow you to train different levels of animals. Like you could domesticate brahmin or domesticate like dogs or pig or like mole rats, uh, depending on what your level was. And then like they could follow you around and help you fight. So that was kind of a nice thing. The, the car fetish. So what does car fetish do for you? I'm trying to remember what the fuck car fetish does. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I, I, I can tell you what the best perk is in Fallout, though. There's only one character, I think, that had that. She was she was in the Boulder Dome. Damn it. Fuck. Daryl, do you know what the best perk is to have in Fallout, period? I, if I'd known that, the rats probably wouldn't have killed me so many times. Oh, well, it, I don't, it, it, is, it is somewhat helpful, but it's, it's mostly cosmetic. The best possible perk in Fallout is, of course, Bloody Mess. Oh, that's right. Makes those makes those enemies explode like Yep. Oh. It's like it's like it takes it takes Fallout from Mad Max and moves it all the way into Fist of the North Star territory. I was thinking of Kira. <laughs> Where shit just blows the fuck up when you kill it. <laughs> we actually we actually made one perk that was just based on uh, the companion Ian from Fallout One. Right. Uh, we called it a uh, friendly foe. And the way it worked was you, you, you could never actually do friendly fire on anybody. Because, like, Ian, Ian in Fallout 1 would always grab a submachine gun and then spray bullets across the battlefield and usually do more damage to you than the enemy. <laughs> uh, but, and, and, fr- and friendly fire was always a danger, like, like no matter what combat you were in. But if you chose this particular uh, perk, then uh, you never actually hit someone with friendly fire. Hmm. That was, that was, that was, I wish I could give that to Ian. Yes, you know what? That, and that's exactly why I made it. <laughs> you know, if I just leveled up, it would have made things a lot easier for me. 
We can come back to the car fetish thing. It's not a big deal. Yeah, you know what? I probably wasn't that effective. <laughs> <laughs> it does make me think of those girls who are like, you know, what do you drive? You know? And in Fallout, you'd be like, what do you drive? Well, I have the only car well, I think, <laughs> in I North America. Have, if I were to guess, I think it probably just gave her mechanics and uh, electronics bonuses when scavenging stuff out of cars because those things were just littering everywhere. Like, we actually had, like, car graveyards in Van Buren, which... You know, you, you can't repair them to drive around necessarily. But what you could do is, like, you know, scavenge your glove compartments, take other engine parts. Like, oh, there's a, there's basically, each one would be like a little loot crate that you could pop open. Nice. But, if you had, but if you had that mechanic skill. And, like, and her thing was, like, hey, if you brought her cars or if she was, like, w- like with you in a, in a situation like that, she could just scavenge more from them than otherwise. You know, that, like, we try to, make, we try to like, give a little, little personality because uh, she, she was just obsessed with cars, even, even though they didn't really run. <laughs> What lessons did you learn from working on Van Buren that you took forward into uh, other stuff? So first off was I think that the experiment was very successful, mostly because it was a turn-based game feeding into a turn-based game. I also think it was really successful because the development team that was going to work on Fallout actually got to adventure through the location before actually building it or needing concept art, they actually would know what the location was without me having to explain it anymore. Like they would know what the Boulder Boulder area was. They would know what Denver was. Oh, I, I love this idea, by the way. Yeah, it, it worked out pretty well. And like like we had uh, one of our world builders there, and, you know, designers, one of our scripters, artists, like all those people were able to absorb that information. And and usually they would also contribute to it by going, hey, what, man, it would be cool if if this location at this, or I'm going to go see if this location has this particular item. And I'm like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. And then I could just make a note of it and add it. And then they would also, they would also be contributing to the design of the game, which was actually, which was pretty cool too. I, uh, I wish I had done this kind of thing or had the ability to do this kind of thing on my first video game project, which was uh, the MMO, the unfortunately canceled MMO, uh, Dark Millennium Online. Because there were a lot of times I would, you know, as a writer, you'd be like, okay, here's this zone and here's what's going on in the zone. And trying to communicate that sometimes to the level designers was really hard. Yeah, and I'm a, thinking now if I could have just ran them through it as an RPG, oh, my God. <laughs> well, I mean, and, uh, the Van Buren, like, it, it was basically uh, a really rare opportunity because, because we couldn't actually work on Fallout for a long period of time. And we had a default to figuring out another way to test this stuff. Pen and paper was really the only, only route. And even so, like, doing sessions every week. Like that's a pretty slow process, and uh, that was that was a hurdle. Like we went through probably about four or five detailed locations in Van Buren in the pen and paper game, but you know there were there were many more in the intended for the actual computer game. So the time required to actually run people through that, and then also having developers willing to play a pen and paper game. I know that sounds really strange, but. Not every department is as, is as excited as the design department is to play, you know, yeah. pen and paper games. So that, that that's a challenge in itself, too. No, you're that, right. That was something point. that kind of shocked me when I got back into the tech industry uh, after working a bunch of administrative jobs was I was expecting, yay, tech industry. I'm doing IT work again. I'm going to be surrounded by a bunch of nerds. And we're all going to be talking about Doctor Who and Red Dwarf and, and we're going to be <laughs> uh, talking about D&D and everything else. And nope, I'm with a guy from Manchester who loves 80s pop music and Manchester United. Uh, another guy was just the biggest Detroit Lions fan ever, and I was the only person who had ever even heard of Red Dwarf. So oh. it, it kind of shocked me how many people are in the tech industry that aren't really what we would call nerds. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think one, one thing that uh, sometimes game developers take for granted is the fact that so many people share the same hobbies and interests. It's really easy to have a conversation. Definitely not the case outside of game development. Like I had um, uh, one of my uh, ex girlfriends, she had to hide her wow addiction from her accounting co wow. because once they would find out something like that, like they just didn't relate, they couldn't relate to it. And also, it, it you know, it, it was a basically a, an ostracization mark if you played computer games. And the, the fact that computer gaming or nerd culture isn't quite as well accepted outside of certain venues is kind of depressing. But, you know, I, it seems to be doing a resurgence or whatever. And there's the delineation, <laughs> too. I always ran into the problems. Oh, my God, I can't believe you're playing that Halo game all the time. Uh, by the way, do you, have you gotten past level 148 in Candy Crush yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Candy Crush. Facebook casual gaming on tablets, too. Yes. <laughs> oh, Candy Crush. 
Speaking of which, uh, just to remind people out there, uh, Sentinels of the Multiverse is available on I- iPad, and it's awesome. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. Uh, awesome. Could you repeat that one more time? I'm not sure I caught all of it. Uh, Sentinels of the Multiverse. It's this great card game that I love. Uh, let you play superheroes. You would probably get a kick out of it. Oh, okay. And uh, it's a cooperative card game. And they have a, a an iPad version of it now. And it's, yeah, you know how, you know, you know when you're sitting somewhere, like in a doctor's office waiting to get in, you're like, I'm going to play something. Yeah, that's pretty much what I play. So I consider tablets and, and mobile games to be a blessing for that reason. Because that's something I don't lose patience when I'm in line. I'm like, okay, well, I can just, you know, <laughs> for a while. And that's, it's much, it's much more soothing. Now, it says here you learned something of, from Van Buren about perk construction. Yeah, um, actually, I learned that from uh, – so what, one of our players was, uh, was uh, Josh Sawyer, who was the project director on New Vegas. The character he played in the first, the first Van Buren game, Arcade Ganon, actually ended up being a companion in New Vegas, although I don't know if the two exactly corresponded with each other. But that that companion was the one he wrote, and it's also the one that he that he played a version of in Van Buren. And Josh, along with a number of other folks they were playing with, were very system conscious, which is what I wanted. What I wanted, so they were able to break down what worked about perks and what didn't. One of the one of the lessons that uh, Josh relayed was, uh, it's kind of lazy perk design to simply take a perk that gives you more points in a skill like there needs to be some other twist to it rather than just you know increasing a percentage for one particular attribute that you just simply do through normal play like try and make some other aspect to it that makes getting the perk worthwhile and i, and I thought that was a fair assumption well, well yeah that's we, we learned that back in the old 3.5 3.0 D D days uh with feats and there were a lot of feats that had just like a plus two to this skill or plus two to that skill, and they were just the worst. Yep. But the feats no one that ever took those. The, well, the, the people that didn't know any better took them, which is mm. kind of that's that's almost as bad, honestly. But the I, uh, I, I sense a division of thought here, Daryl. Dar- are you are you do you have an objecting thought? <laughs> no, no, I it's kind of agreeing. It's, yeah, uh, it, they were those sorts of feats where it's just like okay, you get plus one to this. There's no real theme to it. It's just okay, you get plus two to this skill and plus two to this skill. It's practical but boring at times but it almost always ended up under power compared to the other stuff you could get that you could because you could find anything that can boost your skills i mean experience points do that you want something that you can't get anywhere else when you're looking at something like a perk or a feat that's where fifth edition ed is really excelling is it's taking that same lesson that that chris learned mm-hmm. about perks and, and applying it to feats because in fifth edition your feats are very special rules. They, they change the way your character interacts with the game mechanically. And I think that is a, a such a major improvement. So I, I think it's interesting that a lot of the stuff that Chris is talking about, like the lessons he learned and the things that he went through, actually have a real world, like, you know, this is also a, a parallel in our own industry. I, I would agree with that. And, and yeah, I, I really appreciated all the, all the systematic input. And then and the guys were always really good about helping with game balance, too. Uh, usually they would exploit whatever it was for a session or two. <laughs> and they're like, so they're like, the rest of the unarmed skill has to drop the following, <laughs> the following <laughs> actions because they're just, they're just too, too much. I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. And then you know, we, we would talk about a new system for it and it all worked fine. So the, um, or at least up to, up to unarmed 75%. God, God knows how bad it would have been or farther. So some of these lessons could have been taken into uh, Arcanum, for example. <laughs> Possibly. Uh, <laughs> we still know, need I, to bring you on to talk about Arcanum. I still have to do the Let's Play. Like the, uh, I'll be honest. Like I've, I've finished up the Avatar Backer Awards for Eternity, and then um, then there's work on the novella, and then there's anything that I can do to help out with content. Although the text is kind of locked down now, so there's not too much I can help out with in that area. The Let's Play, I mean, I'm definitely going to get back to. It's just a matter of well, after I'm done making the core product better, because that has to be the most important thing. Oh, absolutely. No question. But I, yeah, I, but no, I'd be happy to, to talk about it, and uh, hopefully I can actually play it in a more relaxed set of circumstances than I did uh, previously. I don't know. It's kind of, kind, of, kind of weird doing it at work, and then you get all the equipment like sort of attached to you, and you don't really feel like you're kind of immersed anymore. You feel like you know, you're being peered at by a thousand people. <laughs> Uh, yes, you're, you are our, our test guinea pig, our monkey, <laughs> our game monkey. Play more. Play more, monkey. I will do what I can. <laughs> yeah, but that, that, that time factor for uh, the pen and paper Van Buren, that, that was the biggest hurdle because we actually tried doing uh, pen and paper 
testing sessions for Neverwinter Nights 2 on really? Obsidian. But we, we really could only manage about three sessions before people's time got evaporated and it was just taking too long. And it was a worthwhile experiment, but it's, I mean, again, you, you just got to have the time to do it. You know, Chris, I'm glad you brought up Neverwinter Nights 2. Good. Because you should bring up Neverwinter Nights 2. I, I love that game, but I have to ask. Okay. What is up with that ending? Um, it's like the grumpy cat ending. Yeah, it's, I, 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 I freely admit that uh, Neverwinter Nights 2 could have benefited from a much, much stronger ending. Uh, so, uh, okay, moving on. <laughs> so, so here's, here's the curse that I think some franchise games have. And this is, this is, this doesn't excuse the, the end result of that. There is so much legwork up front. And this, this happened on, you know, uh, Planescape, it happened on Neverwinter 2. There's this feeling that when players are either brand new to an area or a setting, there's certain things like you have to do in order to introduce them to it. Like, like you have to, like if you're in Neverwinter, like, or, or if you're doing Forgotten Realms, like you have to go to Neverwinter. Like, okay, well, now you have to deal with all the Luskin stuff. And then, like, oh, here's how Thieves go. Like, you have to like get all this potential stuff that you know you may have been familiar with for god knows how many years but the player might not be familiar with so for example when we're doing planescape like some of those items were oh well we have to introduce people to sigil oh we have to do plane traveling like regardless of like whatever other story you might want to tell there are certain things you should probably do to introduce people to the setting and then also uh because they're, they're core to it um so i think there one or two had that problem we're like oh well you have to go to the sword coast I'm like Ugh, all right whatever sword coast but then after we got all that all out of the way, then with the expansions, we could go elsewhere. I'm like, oh, thank God. And, and George Zeitz and Kevin Saunders, who are on um, the spiritual successor to uh, Planescape Torment, Tides of Numenera. God, that's a lot to say. They, uh, <laughs> they, so they, they did Math of the Betrayer, which is the first expansion pack. And George is like, well, here's kind of the story I want to tell. And I think it'd be a lot cooler if we went here. And we interacted with these characters and there's a spirit bear and like, you know, you got this red wizard, but she's got some issues and she's bald. And I'm like, wow, this is kind of interesting. She's like, yeah, and there's like this half angel. And like, we got to, you know, we got some, you know, anyway, so like it's all, this, it's, all this, it's all this new stuff. And then like, and then also he had this really cool direction for, you know, attack, not attacking, but questioning the the theology of certain elements of the forgotten realms like all the way you know in the afterlife and that was just really well done i'm like wow that's pretty cool i'm sort of just a breath of fresh air but because we got neverwinter nights 2 sort of out of the way first like you got all the classic dwarf and elf stuff out of the way then you can start exploring more microcosms in that universe that might be a lot more interesting to sink your teeth into so you know this this can't help but remind me of like the kind of issue that we have with uh superhero movies right and they keep we keep retelling that origin story Uh, because they feel like they have to right like it's exhausting and and, you know i think i think if one thing we can learn from that is like you don't really have to tell the origin story sometimes sometimes you can just jump right in for god's sake we know he's bitten by a spider uncle ben dies (laughs) great power great responsibility start the damn movie already (laughs) Well, well, Dread is a great comic book movie. It's my favorite comic book movie. Well, not oh, my second good. favorite, you know. But Dread is it, it is not an origin story. It just it just puts you there. You're in Mega City One. You're following Judge Dread. He does stuff, and well, it's it, an awesome movie. It kind of is an origin story though, because they have that viewpoint character of the rookie. Um, but it's but it's, it's but it's it's the origin of her, not Dread. But it also gives you the origin of Dread in so much as you there is an origin for Dread. But, but it's but only With, it's but that's. You it, get my point, though. That's yeah, not what the movie the origin, is about. But it's not an origin story. Yes, yes. It, it contains the origin without being. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if you couldn't apply that to, you know, some of these things Chris is talking about design wise. For like, if we if we were going to do a superhero game, you know, couldn't is there a way to to, to make it where you don't have to check off all those little check boxes before you get to the thing you want to do? I'm sure there's a way to do it. I, I will say, like, when it comes to superhero movies, uh, one, one sort of quote-unquote origin story that I thought worked really well was the uh, the Watchmen opening. Yes. That, within a span of, like, I get what I'm mean, in, two or three minutes, you suddenly have an understanding of the whole world and how it got that way. Yes. And, and then 
that you understand the context for everything after that. And it, 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 I thought it worked great. Like it just all went from the, the highs to those horrible, horrible lows throughout. It was just, oh. Or the, uh, the intro to the Ed Norton Hulk movie had a really good effective, yep. you know, here's five minutes of the origin. Now let's get to the actual movie. Yep. So, yeah. Anyway, so getting back to Fallout. Uh. <laughs> and also, actually, I should, I should, I should probably, I should probably uh, throw, throw a conditional in there. Even though there's that feeling we have to tell the origin story or introduce people to the Sword Coast or even introduce, uh, you know, the Planescape basics to, to new players, that that's never should ever be an excuse for, for like, not reaching quality on a product. But those might end up being tired themes to you, but often it's just, obviously it's the execution of how you make those elements. And I think Neverwinter 2 had a number of challenges to make that happen. I think there's, there's, there's parts of that game that really shine, other parts that I think could have used a, a, quite a bit more work. And that's, 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 I think that's absolutely the case. But, you know, it, it's a matter of you really shouldn't see those limitations as limitations or just, you know, new ways to to try and stretch your design muscles. And I, and I don't know if that always happened on every single project that, you know, has, has popped out. So, Well, I always like to say, uh, as, as, as what I've done in, in the gaming industry, I always like to say I aim for making a good game, not a perfect game. Because <laughs> aiming for perfection is just, uh, it's, you know, it's kind of self-defeating, really. And, and I have things I look back on, too. Like, uh, there's games like Death Watch that I designed that if I could do again, I would definitely you know, do some things differently, but is it a good game? Yes, it's it's definitely a good game. And just like I was giving you some shit over Neverwinter Nights 2's ending, Neverwinter Nights 2 is a good game. I like it. I'm a big fan. <laughs> I, I freaking love the whole, like, build up the keep and defend it, like, uh, section. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, uh, that was, uh, a lot of that was done with, uh, one of, one of our, uh, lead, lead area designers here, Constant Gaw. He had the drive and the energy to make that sequence happen. And I'll, I'll tell you, like, the moment I saw those siege towers coming towards the wall, I thought that was one of the coolest things that I, I'd seen up to date. I'm like, holy crap, this is actually a siege. It's awesome. I mean, I was, I was having a blast with it. I was, I was really impressed with his work. So yeah, so I think, I think, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you know, you, you and I, both being designers, you know, we have, we see a lot of the cracks and probably take them a little more harshly than than most people who actually enjoy the product do. I, I would agree with that. <laughs> and it's the same thing with any artist. I I go back and listen to old podcast episodes. I'm like, oh my god, I, the editing on this is so horrible. But it it is what it is. You you can either you can either make the perfect thing or you can actually get it out there and publish and print or whatever. Yeah, I also think that Neverwinter Nights too, and the the uh, you know Mask of the Betrayer. The the you know the obvious lesson there is, you know, once you have the the basic engine and the basic systems and implemented, and you know a lot of the the bugs are, are out, and you just focus on making content, and then you just start developing a little bit more design mechanics on top of that, and you just keep doing that from project to project, you just end up with a much smoother experience like i think like bioware and you know blizzard do this so bioware has a fantastic methodology where like literally they just take you know one system they develop for a game and they just keep iterating on it until three or four games later you don't recognize it anymore but it's still based on the same principles that like like the like knights of republic that whole you know talking head uh interface they had for that like that was basically you know all the Aurora tool set conversation tools, but now they just change the cameras around and then they just kept iterating on that, making the cinematics tools even better until like, you know, a few games later, you don't recognize what it used to be, but it still has all the same design principles, but you can, but you've just polished the shit out of it. I hate to do this because this is a fascinating conversation, but we do need to bring it back to fallout. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> so a couple of quick things I want to ask you about is there's rumors. There's words in the wind Words in the wind of things like Fallout Four and the fact that the name Van Buren has in fact been uh, copyrighted uh, by In Exile for 2014. Uh, that, that is correct. So, what can you tell us anything about what that means? Um, so, with the copywriting of both, uh, I believe it's Mean Time and Van Buren, uh, that I actually uh, don't have much information on. Uh, I, I did want to pick Brian Fargo's brain about it at, at some point when my work schedule gets a little bit lighter and some of the uh, the Numenera stuff is uh, is is wrapped up. Um, 
So I don't have any new information on that. But what, one thing I am kind of excited about is I feel like um, In Exile has done a pretty great job of setting up some core RPG franchises. And I think they're going to be able to keep leapfrogging those in the future, in which case, you know, that's another RPG studio out there that's actually developing RPGs I want to play. So that's just a good thing for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is a but, good thing for all of us. Yep. Yeah. And also, I, you know, I, I, the, the work with Wasteland too, I think proved that that can be, you know, a successful model uh, for, you know, it, it, it seems to have done well in, in sales and uh, the reviews were good. Uh, and then there was a proven market for it. So I, I think that ended up being a very successful experiment. And, uh, obviously, uh, the, the Torment successor also did very well. And then uh, I, I have pretty high expectations for Baldur's Gate. Wow, I almost said Baldur's Gate. Wow, I just I need to have my Pillars shortcut. Pillars of Eternity? Uh, Is that the one? Uh, no, that's not. That's, that's oh. your Obsidian. Uh, yeah, oh. that should be. That should be. Yeah, the. Uh, oh, that game. Yeah, nobody cares about that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about it. That's, that's definitely getting a good reception. People are certainly very, very excited. And it's, oh my God, it's such a pretty game. I wish I could. Talk more about it. The, uh, the a lot of the stuff I'm involved with the story, so we usually don't uh, we can't talk too much about it. But we do. Like, I don't know when this the podcast is going to hit, but the um, we're actually doing another showing of um, the Pillars of Eternity uh, gameplay footage. I think at PAX East, uh, the Saturday mm-hmm. at PAX East, and uh, we're going to show some new locations and some companion stuff, which will be pretty cool. Yeah, this will yeah, probably go up good. after that because I think that's just a week and a half away. So from when we're well, recording, so. If you saw it at PAX East, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> certainly, that's certainly out there uh, in the interwebs. And we'll find we'll find links to it and post them in the show notes. But have you okay, heard thanks, Daryl. Have you heard anything about Fallout Four? So Fallout Four is a question that I get asked about a lot. Um, I don't know anything about it. I would be surprised if the franchise did not continue. It certainly seems to have done very well for Bethesda, and it's very it's a franchise dearly loved by developers and fans so i my opinion would be that it's just simply a matter of time and i certainly hope they take all the time that they want and need to deliver something cool because i think they will i totally agree i totally agree take your time guys come out with something awesome those of us who are you know huge video, huge video game fans have all seen what happens when you rush something out <laughs> yeah and that's that's a that's a good chunk of your life to put into a game that yeah yeah it's just not worth it now, we, there's obviously Nuka Break. We talked about that a little before. But if you're still a Fallout fan and you want to look at some other things that are out there for Fallout uh, besides Nuka Break and besides these games that we've talked about, uh, what else What else is out there, Chris? Um, there's a lot of really cool mod communities. Uh, there always was a good uh, a good mod base around uh, many of Bethesda's games, usually because they make the, the tool set available to the public, which I think is pretty smart. It, it requires a lot more resources to do that. But uh, I think the rewards you get for it is pretty great. So, uh, like, there's the ne- there's the Nexus uh, uh, mod community is one. The um, also um, uh, one of my friends, uh, Christopher Means, is heading up uh, a mod project called Fallout Lone Star, and that takes place uh, in the heart of Texas, but a universe. And uh, uh, he uh, he and I correspond on uh, you know design doc critiques, and um, I try and share all the mistakes that I made and give whatever little fallout knowledge I can, but he's, he's got an uh, amazing concept artist. Uh, he was able to assemble a team and, and granted a mod team kind of fluctuates from, you know, depending on what people's schedules are, or, you know, if they grab people graduate or move away or just some way to get other responsibilities. But the amount of content they've gen- generated for it, uh, I was actually uh, pretty impressed by. And I, anyone out there looking to break into the game industry, one of the best things you can do is take a mod tool set from a yes. company, company you want to work for and then make really make, just make content for it. And that helps you in the interview, like that helps you know all the pipelines and processes, and that'll help you get a leg up on other applicants that haven't delved quite so deeply. So Chris, uh, what are your final thoughts on, on Van Buren on both the PNP and the, uh, the video game version thereof? Well, um, so I spent, uh, th- three years developing all that content for Van Buren and, and a good chunk of it uh, went away or was unrealized or, or either mutated or a small percentage went into New Vegas. Um, I, I still don't regret it. I think that um, there were all still a lot of like positive design experiences I took away from it. Um, I, I do wish we could have done more with it. I, I just wish the surrounding infrastructure 
that was to support the game could have been more solid and it would have been nice to see what would have been realized. But I, I think the pen and paper experiment was was really good, but that might have been because Fallout was going to be turn-based and because we had the time to do it. Right. Um, and I think that's that's the big challenge of it. Well, you know, the, the PNP is actually spread out pretty far onto the internet, so you can go look and find... A, I'm looking at a wiki of it right now, as a matter of fact, uh, which we'll put a, a link to in the fallout, in the uh, the show notes for this this episode. Uh, but they they have, like, their own Nukipedia and things like that. It's 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 just awesome. The guy, Some guy called uh, Jason Michael. Do you know him? Uh, I... So, Ross, I have to tell you one... Uh, one uh, debilitating condition of my stealth boy use is that uh, my, my mental Rolodex has disintegrated and I can recognize faces and sure. I know the personalities behind them, but I, I have so much trouble recalling people's names that I, I I feel bad. I almost wish that there was an interface design that would cause like title <laughs> and name to appear above people's heads like when you, like, 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 like an MMO. That would be fantastic. And I'm like, oh, thank God I can remember this person's name. Well, this guy's name is Jason Michael, and uh, he he is well known for making this fan made version of the Fallout pen and paper RPG. Uh, according to the wiki, he was contracted by uh, a company to write an official Fallout pen and paper one, but oh, uh, cool. but legal issues unfortunately rose up between yeah. Bethesda and, and the company, and uh, it was canceled. Uh, but he this guy's worked on uh, All Flesh Must Be Eaten for cool. Eden's. All right. Yeah, uh, and uh, did some work for for Wiz Kids on on some things, uh, but it, it's just interesting that this guy you know has created this thing now PNP. That's I mean you could find it anywhere on the on the web if you do a web search for follow up PNP. Well, and I, I do want to point out it's exciting. Is, the the game that you're looking at is actually different than the one Chris has been talking about. This is oh uh, I know I, I okay. know that I'm okay. just saying okay. I'm okay. pointing out that there is one. Okay, and it's based on the D20 Modern Open Gaming License. So right. it's going to have okay. familiar roles to you, if you're a yeah. That, that's what I'm, that's what player. I'm saying is okay. like it's not. It, this is not the game we're talking about, but okay. it is a version of Fallout Pen and Paper. I was kind of speaking in the the general okay. idea that there is a role playing game in which you can play in the Fallout okay. universe. I, I was just want to make sure we were clear on that. <laughs> okay, but yeah, they, but, uh, um, this is uh, this is the game that ended up uh, evolving into something called Exodus. Uh, yes. Whenever they lost the rights to the Fallout, they basically ported right. it over to their own world. Now, what I think is interesting is, um, if I'm understanding Chris correctly, when he was doing the, the Van Buren one, the adventuring paradigm was that everyone was basically vault dwellers who were, you know, trying to get along in the wasteland despite all the other factions that were getting in the way. Is that basically true? It, in some respects, the <laughs> okay. So, go ahead. What what is the adventuring okay, paradigm? Okay, so <laughs> the adventuring paradigm here is so what one mechanic we had was. There would be people in your cell block, and you could choose to free some of them, or some might not escape. Totally up to you at the beginning, but but you make choices. Like half your cell block could die. Okay. Now all of those people are different quest seeds that pop up later on once they scatter out of, outside the prison. Right, but you're and still vault dweller, right? Uh, no, no. Okay. The 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 trick was they all get vault suits. Ah. And they're all going to be vaulted. <laughs> I get but, it. But it's, problems have occurred. Okay. Uh, and But ultimately, all the prisoners don't necessarily like each other. And in fact, a, a lot of the immediate nemesis that we got in the pen and paper game were just because people in the cell block hated each other. <laughs> at, which point, at which point they start hunting each other down. And then it becomes battle royale in that sense because, you know, when you have the, the world's best, you know, uh, knife fighter right. going after a bunch of armed guys, suddenly, like, you know, he starts – butchering them for their pip boys and you know taking all their gear and loot and and moving on but uh the, the idea was that we wanted that immediate reactivity we're like hey well you may not get these three npcs what if you met a guy who his had made a suit out of pip boys wow <laughs> can you do that good <laughs> oh, that'd be creepy i know <laughs> See, now I'm lost in the thought. See, because, you know, you, you could talk in other people's voices and stuff. It would actually be really freaky. You could sync all the screens so they could, like, maybe camouflage you. I don't know. It would be weird. It would be so weird. Yeah, you know, and I, again, like, the, depending on what prisoners you you, you chose, like, they, they they would scatter to different communities 
that you knew that they would either come from or factions they were trying to get back to. And that would end up being a lure for you to go to those factions to try and find those people and get them back. So they, they ended up being like little, you know, flowery, you know, quest seeds literally spread across the wasteland. Right. And then it would evolve into it would evolve into the uh, the the plague thing and all that. Yeah. Got it. OK. So, Daryl, uh, do you mind if I ask you what you think about all this uh, stuff? Because I, I know that pretty much has been Chris and me because we're the follow up guys on yeah. this show. And it makes me want to jump right in and start playing again. But there is <laughs> one thing that I am really, really glad about is I've been reading around uh, trying to get prepared for the episode and. The one thing I know is after this episode airs, a lot of wikis are going to be updated with a lot of new information that isn't out there that I'm aware of. Well, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't have thought to do a topic like this if you guys had given me a, a chance to to propose it. And also, like again, like thanks to the Kickstarter backers for allowing, allowing the opportunity. I, I don't know if I would have come up with this topic, but then I'm like, what would be like a really you know cool both kind of like digging into the past. And about, but yet about a, a popular franchise that people might not have, you know, been aware of before. And there's, there's a lot of stuff that went in. I mean, it was three years. Yeah, that's and a I'm lot always, of time. I always had to talk about it. Just the, um, there was never really an opportunity before. So thanks to you guys and the, and the Kickstarter backers for allowing the opportunity. I, I, I went down memory lane for this one. I'm like, wow, man, that's <laughs> a lot of stuff there. So. Yeah, and, and we really are very grateful for you sharing this information with us. But we actually have something even more exciting, don't we, Chris? We have something we're going to give away. Oh, we do. So I was talking uh, with, with Ross and Daryl, and uh, what we would like to do is uh, I would love to share uh, memorabilia from those early Van Buren pen and paper games. So uh, I have signed versions of the, for example, the first aid cards, the pip points, the doctor cards, and uh, I will be more than happy to have Ross and Daryl disseminate those as they will for whatever they feel is a challenge or they feel is most deserving. I don't, maybe they want a, a battle royale themselves. I, I don't know. <laughs> whatever you guys wish. I, oh, I, I, I think I'm gonna... happy to provide them and, and mail them to whoever wins your contest of strength. I think we're going to have to come up with a cool contest, aren't we, Daryl? Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> we will That's definitely... definitely worthy of something. Yeah. We'll come up with something really good for this one. That is amazing. Chris, you've been an awesome host, and thank you so much for coming on our show, talking about this amazing topic, giving out all this great information. Uh, I know I learned quite a bit, actually, just, just listening to you talk about what you went through these three years you know, um, working on this game, and holy crap. I mean, it's just – it's it's really eye-opening. Well, Rostov, again, like, thanks for having me on the show, and I really appreciate the opportunity to host. And just like last time, I had a blast. So thank you guys very much. And, and thanks again for the kick, to the Kickstarter backers for allowing the opportunity. It's it's really them who made it possible. Yes, it is. Okay. Anything else before we close it up, Chris? Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, I have said as much as I can <laughs> squeeze from my tiny monkey brain. So uh, I, I would just have a I was just happy to be able to talk about pen and paper campaigns because I know that when I hear it from Gather Game Masters, it's not always the most pleasant of experiences. Uh, but maybe the fact that it was in the Fallout franchise makes it, and the fact that it actually got into other games might make it more appealing to people tired of, tired of Game Master stories. Oh my God. I've got to get you in, uh, in one of my convention games because I ran uh, the D&D cartoon in D&D 5th Edition. Oh yeah? <laughs> Where they were all characters from the 1981-1983 uh, cartoon. <laughs> it was awesome. We had a blast. They fought Venger. They rescued Uni. They learned a life lesson. They gave up a chance to go home. It was just like an episode of the show. That uh, that D and D show. That episode where they decide to tell the dungeon master to go f off, and then they go after Venger. The Dragon's was, Graveyard was one of the best episodes I yes. think I've seen as a kid on TV. I'm like, I'm like, hey, wait a minute. The formula is not being followed. <laughs> And they're also kicking Venger's ass. I was like, oh, my God, this is so good. Yeah, Dragon's Graveyard. That is a brilliant episode. All right, guys. Uh, well, that's pretty much all of our time, Chris. So uh, do you want to give the traditional closing? Well, uh, this has been an exciting episode of the Gamers Tavern uh, brought to you by our co-host, Ross and Daryl. And from the Kickstarter again, uh, thank you very much. And it was my pleasure to be able to talk about Fallout Van Buren, a project that was very near and dear to my heart. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And Daryl. And uh, 
Thank you, everybody, all listeners. And that's that's our show. That's Chris's <laughs> show, I should say. <laughs> so you want to get your hands on some of the only copies of this pen and paper RPG designed by Chris Avalon? Well, here is how you do it. Come up with your best Fallout-related haiku. Remember, it doesn't have to rhyme, but it must have five syllables in the first stanza, seven in the second, and five in the third. Next, take that haiku and put it in an email to contest at gamerstavern.org with the subject line, Nuka Break. Third, include your name and mailing address in that email. Finally, hit send and hope your haiku is one of the best. We have three copies of this amazing, not available anywhere else, memorabilia from Fallout. And let me tell you, I'm kind of fucking pissed off. I can't enter myself. I want this so bad. It is... Seriously, do you understand what we're giving away here? This is something that no eyes have seen outside of the development team of the original Van Buren. And I don't have a chance to win because I'm Gamers Tavern. (sighs) But you, you, you have a chance to win by sending your best Fallout-themed haiku to contest at GamersTavern.org Put the subject line, Nuka Break, and earn your unique piece of gaming history. Until next time, the tavern is closed. What is the most important invention in all of mankind? Beer! Longtime listeners will know how much I love good alcohol. But when it comes to craft beers, there's so much out there, it can be intimidating. What's the difference between a brown L and an IPA? And why is there so much German, Hefeweizen, Bach, Dunkel? Where do you start? I'll tell you where. Craft Beer Club. For just $3 each, you'll get three bottles of four different beers right to your door every single month from independent craft brewers of the best quality. In just a short amount of time, you'll be snobbing up with hipsters talking about nose and hops. But Daryl, I can get a 12-pack cheaper at the local store, you say. But can you get specialty regional small batch beers at that price with this much selection? I didn't think so. Besides, you know you'd spend twice that much at a bar for the same beers just to try them out. So go to GamersTavern.org slash Craft Beer Club, and we'll start you out with your first shipment plus three free gifts. That's GamersTavern.org slash Craft Beer Club, and start enjoying real beer.